Acknowledgement. Thanks to you, reader, to read through the story. Thanks to Charlie Hill for his translation kindness and patience. Thanks to Markle Smoke Signal Studio for the awesome cover, and thanks to my supportive wife and kids that always keep me dreaming. One. Friday, October 17, 1918, somewhere in the Mediterranean near the coast of France. We approached the island on a motorboat at full speed. The keel cut through the waves and spatted the air with tiny particles of foam. The sky was covered with thick, dark bellied clouds, and an omnipresent grey light fell down on our small boat. Three other prisoners, handcuffed like me, were travelling in the back, soaked down to their underwear. And you? Why are you here? asked the man sitting to my right. He was slender with rat teeth that chatted over the noise of the engine. His cheeks were scarred by smallpox and his nervous eyes scrutinized me from top to bottom. I fixed my gaze on the horizon, the silhouette of the island just a few miles away. I was still unable to process everything that had happened. The man blinked and repeated the question. I didn't answer him, but that didn't discourage him. He must have been scared to death. As we all were. Where did you get caught? he asked. I thought he must be turning his head towards me, to avoid looking at our destination. In Bois de Mon. Soldier. Pilot. That's bad luck. The man looked at the ground. His drenched hair dripped thick drops on the deck. I don't belong here, he confessed, more to himself than to any of us. I'm innocent. His voice broke into a cry that he silenced by bringing his hands to his face. And who cares if you are, said the black man to my left. He was muscular with a shaved head. He looked scornfully at the other man. Where we're going, that doesn't matter. The prison of Lyle de Lara stood on sharp rocks with a barbed wire face and two turrets. The lighthouse on the promontory of the islet pointed the way with its intermittent pulse of light. There was no other prison like this, those who waved us off knew that. No one would pray for our absolution here, hope was excluded from the blueprint. There was only one way out, and it was in a pine box without ceremony. I hugged myself warm and my chains clanged together. Bernadette, I said to myself, how did things get so twisted? 3. There were no clocks in the prison, at least not where we could see them. Even so, I knew I had finished mopping before the end of the dinner shift. The bell had yet to ring and tell the prisoners it was time to return to their cells. But when I went to open the iron double doors to the dining room, I found them closed. Through the dim glass of one of the door's small windows, Blutch's face emerged. He smiled, though it was more of a sneer, and left, leaving me locked in the yard with the mop and bucket in my hands. I had been cold plenty of times. Fifteen thousand feet above the trenches, the wind cuts like a knife, your hands, despite gloves, tremble on the control lever, and your feet freeze even wearing six pairs of socks. The cold in the prison was different. The sea surrounded us, we heard it crash incessantly against the coast. It filled the air with humidity that easily soaked through my thin linen shirt. Despite that, the effort of mopping had me sweating. The guards at first had fun with me, they blinded me with the intense beam of their spotlight and they threw food scraps at me. One even tried to pee on me from the top of the low wall. But as the hours passed, they lost interest and left me alone. I stretched out on the floor next to the dining room door, curled up in a ball with the cold concrete of the courtyard against my body, my uniform stinking of sweat, and I shivered. I thought about the days I had spent here and how many days I had left, how long I could bear this life sentence. Then I thought of my squad mates, the commander. At last, as much as I resisted it, the image of Bernadette appeared in my mind. The war would soon come to an end, that was what they had said on the front, and somehow I had survived it. But I could never fulfill the promise I made, I could never go back to Paris with her. I would be trapped here until I died. 
in fact to the rest of the world I was already dead. It was with this last thought in my mind and with fatigue closing my eyelids that at last I fell into a deep sleep. 5. Tell me what do you want most? Bishop and I were sitting in the prison dining room, another of our encounters inside of my dream. My body in fact was lying in block A, cell 212. I looked around. The prison was always empty in my dreams. Well, I'd love a good cutlet of veal with carrots and everything. No, I don't mean like that. What I am asking you is, what is your greatest desire? If it were up to me, I would of course escape this prison and... Just imagining Bernadette's face, my hands started to sweat. I looked at the floor. I would go to Paris. I couldn't keep my voice from trembling. There is someone, someone who taught me everything I know, although he did not show me everything. Maybe he could teach you too. He held out his arms, gesturing at the dining room filled with orphaned tables and chairs. It could help us get out of here. Dreaming is all well and good, but freedom. I looked at him without believing him. This was all a game. These dreams and these encounters in my drowsiness had me confused. I was dreaming, but at the same time I was awake. With each new encounter my senses grew sharper, making every sensation feel more real than reality itself. So much so that sometimes I doubted whether I was dreaming at all. Bishop showed me an exercise to help me know if I was dreaming or not. I had to try to push my index and ring finger through the palm of the other hand. If I could, I was dreaming. Listen. He got up and went to one of the iron-grilled windows. The same full moon was suspended in the starry sky. To fly, to pass through walls, to transform into an animal, all that is extraordinary, but it all happens inside the dream. If you can wake up to the next level, if you can reach a state of true lucidity, you can do things that transgress the world of dreams. I am amazed by your progress in these past few days. You have the gift, stronger than I've ever seen. 6. They're taking him out. Andre said, his fingers tangled in the courtyard fence. Phyllis and I were watching the scene from a few yards back, but we came over when he shouted. Two guards emerged from the shed in the south courtyard. Blutch with his back to us blocked our view. All the other prisoners, including those in the neighbouring courtyard, were glued to the fence, waiting for something to happen on the other side. Blutch smashed his leather truncheon again and again into the body that the other guards held. The rhythmic impact bounced between the walls and rose up to the cloudless sky. Blutch didn't stop until his victim was splayed out on the floor. Putin. Phyllis swore. Blutch left the yard and the guards picked up the limp body. The first thing I saw was a mess of black hair. Then I saw bare shoulders where the guards held him. His flesh, so white it gleamed in the winter sun, was covered with scars. When they pulled up him by the arms, his torso followed, and his legs wriggled across the courtyard like the tail of a snake. I wanted to look away from that body, reduced to skin and bones, but I couldn't stop looking at him. That was not the quiet man I had met in my dreams. Did you like the show? Blutch appeared behind us. With a handkerchief, he cleaned the traces of blood from his truncheon. Get in line. We peeled ourselves off the fence and placed ourselves in order. When the doorbell rang, the guards opened the dining room doors and we set off immediately. Look. Andre nudged me with his elbow. I told you. I turned my head and saw Bishop's eyes burning from behind his tangled hair and the crimson blood that stained his face. He stared at us as they carried him to the back of the courtyard and on his lips, a toothless smile that froze my blood. The smile of a devil. 7. Have you heard? Phyllis set down his tray of food on the table and sat next to us. This prison's food, said most veterans, was among the best of all the prisons in Europe. 
I can't speak for the others, Lyle de Lara was the only prison I'd been in, but for me the food here was little more than recycled garbage. It turned my stomach. Today we've got peas. And at Christmas we'll have chickpeas, said Andre, ignoring the question and shoveling a forkful of slop. Heard what, Phyllis? I asked. A guard died. In fact he croaked last night. The guard from the library told me. When the other guards went to wake him they found him dead in bed. Wham! He threw his hand in the shape of a knife. Just like that. One moment you're alive and the next morning. Andre stopped eating and looked around us. The other prisoners ate in silence, there was only the faint murmur of conversation and the silverware clanging against the tin plates. Even the guards who ate at the table in the back remained silent. It's not the first time that happened. He leaned toward us, whispering. Let me tell you this place is cursed. Nonsense, Phyllis said and continued eating. Cursed with crap food maybe. With a lost look Andre picked up his fork again. Phyllis continued the conversation. And you, Marcel, you gonna help us with work duty today? The dining room door opened and Blutch appeared. He crossed the room with his hands behind his back, his chest puffed out like a rooster and his truncheon swinging in its holster. When he sat down next to the other guards, I replied, Deserters don't get that privilege. Giving us a job would make our grief more bearable. We have to stew in the fact that we're still alive. I thought the deserters were shot right there in the trench. Phillips fumbled with his fingernail between his teeth, trying to remove a pea stuck to his gum. Yes, normally, I sighed. I was spared the death penalty for my achievements against the enemy. Blutch and the other guards at the table stood up, and in a solemn toast, their beer mugs collided. Some prisoners turned to watch the show. We kept eating. There's something else, right? Andre pointed at me with his fork. I see it in your face. Nobody comes to Lyle de Lara directly. Everyone else is sent here from other prisons. You don't have to say if you don't want to. We have all the time in the world to work it out. None of us is going anywhere. I nodded in silence. One of these days I'll hear. Phillips took a drink from his glass of water. Marcel does not stop talking in his sleep. He's like a damn machine gun. Well, what's your story, Andre? I asked, avoiding having to explain. I was just a watchmaker. A watchmaker with a little fame and a lot of bad luck. Andre snorted and went back to his food. 8. Our cell was no more than 3 meters by 5. It had a bunk bed, I slept on the bottom, a sink, a tiny toilet and a shelf where we kept our scant belongings. I couldn't receive mail from anyone, but I kept a picture of Bernadette hidden between the pages of a book. Looking at it returned me to the present. Bishop had promised me that the day would come when I could leave prison. Lucid dreaming I would go wherever I wanted, I just needed more practice. We had been here a long time already, and I was getting bored of dreaming the same thing over and over again. I went through walls, I flew, I transformed into animals, but that did nothing to ease my heavy heart. It was just a distraction, the only one I had. Do you hear that purr? I asked Phyllis, who was reading on his bunk. That sound. I don't hear anything. That's a biplane engine. I shouted when I realized. And it's getting closer to the island. That distant buzz was so familiar to me. The aerial battlefield had sharpened my senses. The survival of any pilot depended on it. Now I can hear it. What a scandal. I approached the door of the cell. There were no guards in the corridor which meant that the curfew would start soon and the lights would be switched off. I put my head between the bars and called our neighbor. Andre. Andre. What's up, Marcel? 
Why aren't you sleeping? Have you seen a biplane on the island before? I would bet that this engine is an SE5. From the neighboring cell, Andre whispered, Urgent mail. It comes from time to time, bringing news of the war. Now let me sleep. At that moment, the lights of the block were turned off, and we were left in the dark. From the small window of the cell, I could only see the courtyard, but I heard clearly how the biplane maneuvered, the gunning of the engine to lift the nose. The wheels hit the asphalt, and after a few seconds, there was silence. 10. I'm not a murderer, I found myself saying. Andre, Phyllis and I were looking through the gate into the south courtyard, towards the empty shed. There was a mutiny in the barracks. Andre and Phyllis were huddled close to listen to me, as I babbled like an idiot. I let my confession escape in a weak voice. Our commander wanted to send us on a suicide mission, flying over occupied territory through the path of a million projectiles. We refused, and the discussion became so heated that the commander drew his weapon. He wanted to force us to fly at gunpoint. I tried to disarm him, and accidentally pulled the trigger. A stray bullet entered his trachea and pierced the back of his skull, killing him instantly. Seriously. Phyllis ran a hand over his forehead and then scratched at the scars on his cheek. That was bad luck. Andre gave me a squeeze on the shoulder. In his glasses, I saw my tired face reflected. Those nights of training with Iroquois were consuming me to the bone. Come on, Marcel, Andre tried to cheer me up. At least you're not dead. It's not so bad here, you have us. Surely in time the guards will ease up on you. Maybe, I answered. I wasn't convinced. You shouldn't torture yourself about what happened, believe me. Andre's smile, for some reason, made me feel better. What happened outside these walls stays out there. This now is our reality. He spread his arms like a bird. Is it really? I thought to myself. If what the Indian was teaching me really worked, there were many ways to live beyond the walls, in other realities. And the one I had in mind, it had nothing to do with Lyle de Lara. 11. I woke up in my cell, stretched out on the bunk. Everything around me seemed to be in the right place. The intense smell of rust made me feel dirty. It had been days that someone had to repair that damn leaky pipe, but in prison our comfort was far from a priority. This is a dream, I said out loud. Using the index and ring fingers of my left hand, I tried hard to press them through the palm of my other hand. The fingertips felt the flesh and bones. What's happening? Can't you sleep? Phyllis's voice sounded from the bunk above. The light of the moon slid through the bars of the small window behind me, my own shadow was projected long, stretching on the bedsheet. I closed my eyes and tried to remember what I had dreamed. I had a very strange dream. Oh yeah. Something dirty, I'm sure. I don't stop having them. No, not like that. I stroked my temple, I had a slight headache. I dreamed that I was a shadow and that I walked freely through the prison. I slipped through doors and walls. And where did you go? Phyllis stuck his head over the edge of his bunk. I went to the kitchen. And now that I remember it, I dreamed that I brought myself a plate of food and some. I jumped up from the bunk and ran to the cell door. There it was on the floor right next to the bars, a plate of stewed meat and a couple of beer bottles. Phyllis. You got to see this. Phyllis ran to my side. When he saw the little feast, his mouth fell open and eyes went wide. We didn't wake Andre to avoid alerting the guards or the other prisoners. We shared a toast with the beer bottles and drank their rich nectar as if it were the best champagne in the world. 14. Marcel. I heard Phyllis screaming from beyond the fence. 
He was waving his arm, calling my attention. His face was a mask of fear. Now it was me who was in the south courtyard, and who drew the intrigue of all the other prisoners. Some put their hands to their mouths, others couldn't stand the sight of me and turned their backs. Two guards dragged me from the shed to the door that led to the cell blocks. In only three days I had lost half my weight. My face was still swollen like a misshapen ball. The lumps on my forehead had almost disappeared between the soft and inflated flesh. Bruises covered my entire skull, and my nose was just two holes in the center of all that disaster. But that didn't matter now. I could only think of how to escape and reconnect with Bernadette. 15. Phyllis was sitting on the floor and I was on the bunk, we were playing Bataille. Because of his good behavior and his hours of prison labor, he had been given back his lucky gavel. And with this, the game is mine. Phyllis showed me his card and then threw it with the others on the ground. I had been in prison for months and thanks to him and Andre, the stay was getting much more bearable, but I refused to accept that I would end my days there. Phyllis, what would you do if you were free to go? Leave the prison. Are you crazy? Well, imagine this situation. We draw up an infallible plan and we manage to escape. What would you do? Im. He thought as he scratched his cheeks. I would try to do better. Do what better? Life. I would lead a more honest life. For the time I've got left. Why steal? Why hate? There's enough room for everyone. We don't have to fight about it. I laughed and he frowned. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. I just found it amusing how naive that sounded. Maybe you're right. Maybe now that the war is almost over, it's time to have a long think about what we're doing on this planet, right? Exactly. Do you hear that? Again, Marcel. I jumped up as if burnt with a brand. That sound was what Bishop and I had been waiting for all this time. Now I can hear it, said Phyllis. How could I not hear it before? The SE-5 engine flew over the prison and moved away again, turning to line up its approach for landing. Finally. Tonight was the night. 16. No, they can't come with us, Marcel. Bishop was standing in my cell with his hands behind his back speaking gravely. Phyllis and my body were sleeping in their bunks. Why? You already know. Apart from the obvious, a single-seat biplane can't take off while carrying four people. What's more, they would slow us down. The chances of getting caught would be doubled at least. But I... I know and I'm so sorry, Marcel. Your intentions are good. But think about what you can do, what we can do together as soon as we're out of here. We could free the entire prison if that's what you want. I nodded without saying anything else. Do you think you're ready? Do you think you can do it? Yes. I'm sure I can do it. That's what I like to hear. Let's not delay any more. At this hour, the pilot must be having dinner at the foreman's mansion. If he has to return to the mainland tonight, time is against us. About the author Sam G. C. is a cartoonist, illustrator, graphic designer and author living in Menorca with his wife, also an illustrator, and his three kids. You can connect with me on http colon slash slash www.samgc.me 2. Who's in there? I asked Phyllis, the man with smallpox scars I had met on the boat. It was only three weeks since we were imprisoned, but it could have been three years. I tried to adapt, to learn and above all, to avoid any kind of conflict. 
In that shed, he said, pointing to the back of the courtyard behind an iron grate. I was wondering too. Since we arrived here I've seen guards stationed there but nobody enters or leaves. He's an Englishman, said Andre, a prison veteran and our cell neighbor in Block A. He was the closest thing to a friend we had met there. His face was affable, full of wrinkles with gray hair and thick glasses. They call him the quiet man. He's been in detention and forced to fast for 36 days. No one knows why, but they lock him up from time to time in that hole. Andre leaned against the fence. When the guards take him out, his arms and legs hang behind him like dry branches ready to snap. It is a miracle that he's alive. And not only that, he always raises his head and smiles at us. His smile is so. I swear that I've never in my life seen anything so chilling, and I've seen a lot of strange things. How can someone live without food or drink for more than 30 days? Phyllis asked, staring at the wooden shed. That's impossible. Andre shrugged. The bell rang signaling the end of the break, and the prisoners ran to line up in rows, according to which block they were stuck in. The courtyard was divided into three sections. Between them was an inverted T-shaped corridor formed from fences about three meters tall and topped with barbed wire. On the south wall was the shed. On the west courtyard was us, the white prisoners, and on the east side were the black ones. Two towers were located at the northwest and southeast corners manned by guards with mounted machine guns. It was a maximum security prison. No one had ever escaped, and I doubted anyone would dare to try. Come on you loafers. Blutch, the head guard, showed up in the courtyard with a worn black leather truncheon out of its holster. He slapped it against the palm of his hand while examining the lines of prisoners. You. The deserter. I saw the end of the baton pointing at me. What's your problem? Don't you know where you're meant to stand? The prisoners were perfectly ordered. I occupied my position in the corresponding section. I looked at my feet. You're five centimeters out of line. Without saying a word he approached where I was, and tracing a long arc through the air he smashed the baton into my stomach. The impact made my whole body shake. The pain bent my knees and I fell face down on the floor. My guts burned, but I was able to get up again. We're obliged to take in waste like you in our facilities. But now you're in my charge. If you don't follow orders, I have permission to use any kind of punishment I want. And believe me, I'm dying to try them all on you. I took my place in line again and Blutch started to walk away, but he stopped and turned back towards me. One second, what's this? His small black eyes, like those of a snake, suddenly lit up. He pointed his truncheon at my legs. To my surprise, I saw that one of my legs was wet and the trail reached down to the ground. There was a small yellow puddle at my feet. You pissed your pants. His laughter echoed on the walls of the courtyard. Other prisoners laughed too. Phyllis and Andre watched the scene in shock. Look. The great Captain Marcel Marlia of the Victoria Squadron. A damn coward. I've read your history. War hero, murderer, deserter. You just keep getting better. Your medals may have saved you from a death sentence, but I'm going to tell you one thing. There is nothing that disgusts me more than a deserter. He grabbed my hair and forced me to look at him. He was almost two meters tall and his eyes, his eyes, they were burning. You will never leave this prison, and I will make sure you pay your penance every day. You will regret being alive every minute of your life. He turned on his heel and stroked his truncheon. Go to the kitchen and ask for a mop. Then I want you to scrub the whole yard and leave it sparkling. You better hurry or you'll miss the end of the dinner shift and have to spend the night out here. 4. I heard my name and opened my eyes. I found myself lying in the middle of the courtyard. The world had turned 90 degrees about me. It was still night and there was a huge moon hanging over a firmament of yellow and pointed stars. Everything was silent. 
I had heard my name but now nothing. There was no wind or waves against the rocks, nor the steps of the guards or the sporadic coughs of some prisoner in his cell trying to sleep. It was total silence, heavy, unreal. I felt neither hot nor cold. I turned my head to the south and saw the shed through the fence. It seemed closer than before. I was surprised to see that the door was wide open and that no guards were watching it. Two fleeting orange flashes illuminated the dark mouth of its entrance. Then a head of messy black hair emerged. And the rest of the body followed. A pale man with broad shoulders and a shaggy beard strode towards me. When he reached the first gate, the border of the south courtyard, he didn't stop. He carried on through, crossing it as if the braided wire wasn't there, as if it were only air. Seconds later, his eyes met mine. I'm happy that you're here. I've been calling you for days. Can you talk, he asked in a voice that was calm yet serious. I can, I managed as I tried to sit up. His lips formed a smile of satisfaction. He offered me his hand and when I touched it I felt a cramp in my palm. I'm Bishop. Although here they call me the quiet man. I'm impressed, it's your first time lucid dreaming and you can already talk. What? I stammered, shaken by what I had just witnessed. I know this is just a dream but how did you walk through the gate? Just a dream, huh? Come with me, he said, and grabbed me by the shoulders, lifting me off the ground effortlessly. He rose up through the air, taking me with him. We floated over the low wall, past the machine gun turrets, and above the second floor of the prison. Soon beneath my feet I could see a bird's eye view of the entire prison and the service building attached to it. Beyond that, a section of the island, the promontory with the lighthouse and the foreman's mansion, and beyond that the sea surrounding the island edged with a white aura of reefs. Our two figures became a part of the sky. The stars and the moon were watching us. He let me go and I hung beside him. But how? You could do this too. I think you have the talent. And not only that, flying is the simplest thing. What are you talking about? I'm talking about dreams. What do you think? You can control your own dreams and so much more with proper dedication. You could break all the rules and be free. Just look at how my dreams have helped my body survive this torture. I still don't understand. We are running out of time, they're coming to wake you up and I don't think they'll do it in the most polite way. Follow my instructions to the letter, lie on your bed stretched out and face up. Before sleep picture the prison yard. I'll meet you there. I will explain everything to you, and teach you everything you are willing to learn. But. Sleep. Dream and everything will come true. 9. I have to confess something. Bishop and I were sitting on the south courtyard. We had imagined a large table with a white tablecloth, several trays of food, bottles of wine and warm bread. Yes. Tell me. I am an assassin. A hired killer. What are you saying? Bishop wiped his lips with his napkin and stood up. Come follow me. I know you're going to judge me for this, but sooner or later you would find out. We crossed the courtyard to the metal double doors that led to the dining room, but instead of entering that room, the door took us somewhere entirely different. Due to the lack of windows and the room's clinical appearance, I assumed we were in some kind of underground hospital. There were people sleeping, lying on beds arranged in rows. On each of their heads, they wore a metal headband connected to some kind of radio. Two men and two women dressed in white coats took notes in small notebooks. Of course, they weren't aware of our presence. Where we are? I asked, without looking away from what was happening around me. This is a memory. We can enter memories the same way we explore dreams. It takes a little practice, but soon I will teach you how to do it. Follow me, 
he said and moved between the beds to a glass wall in the back. Behind the glass was a man, almost a boy, tied with leather bands to a stretcher placed in an upright position. His body spasmed, and he was sweating in the dim light of a fluorescent lamp. Two men in surgical gowns tried to hold him up. The boy cried out but his eyes stayed closed. You recognize him? He pointed a finger at the boy. I shook my head. He stepped through the glass wall and I followed him. One of the men took a syringe from the neatly arranged metal cart and injected the young man in the arm. He stopped moving almost instantly and his muscles relaxed. He fell into a deep, quiet sleep. This is me. Five years ago, just before the war began. That was when they started Project Sandman. He opened his arms wide, encompassing the whole installation. This is April 1914, somewhere in England. He pointed out the dozen people on the other side of the glass sleeping, and the others out there, they don't have anywhere near the talent you have. But what are they doing to you here? And why are you tied to a stretcher? The goal of Project Sandman was to create the ultimate weapon, to use lucid dreams to end lives from a safe and comfortable distance without leaving a trace. The men in surgical gowns placed the young bishop's stretcher in a horizontal position and left the room. But how? Let's go downstairs. Do you remember how to do it? I nodded and Bishop began to sink into the concrete floor. They are a few floors below us. We sank through the floor for meters and meters, passing by a warren of different rooms, cells, warehouses full of rations, operating theaters. Finally, we landed in a circular room with a vaulted steel ceiling. In the center was a lean figure sitting in the gloom. Let me introduce you to Iroquois, my teacher, and maybe yours, Bishop said in a ceremonious voice. He was an old American Indian with a wrinkled face and dark skin. His eyes were sewn shut with a black thread forming small crosses and his chin was stuck to his chest. His silver hair fell to his shoulders in braids, and at the ends it was tied with colored beads and long feathers. He was wrapped in a brightly colored woolen blanket, and only his bare feet poked out from underneath. He was sitting in a wheelchair. This man, this sorcerer, was the one who taught us to control our dreams and travel through them. Taught us? Are there more like you? There was. Bishop knelt beside the old man and took his hands. They only found two people capable of learning what Iroquois intended to teach us. Only two of us had the gift, Igor and me. When we murdered the Archduke, the war broke out. Then Igor swore never to hurt anyone again, despite the threats and torture. He refused to comply with our orders and ended up committing suicide. But in your case... Yes. He closed his eyes, moving back in time, stroking the old man's hands as if that comforted him. They didn't make the same mistake with me. They found a way to coerce me. They hurt all the people close to me. Now they have Sophie, my wife, and Claire, my daughter, under constant surveillance in the foreman's mansion. If I don't follow their orders, they will hurt my family. You have to understand, Marcel. You would do the same for Bernadette, right? Bishop's eyes reflected the pain of his struggle, they were overflowing with anger. Wouldn't you kill to protect her, if you only had to dream to do it? Bishop got up and pushed the old man's chair forward gently. The first thing that Iroquois taught me was to wake up in my dreams. That's the part one managed to teach you, the one that you are now able to control. Then he taught me to see and use the grand tapestry that unites all living beings, we all weave it when we sleep. Notice that I said beings, animals also dream. Following the tapestry's threads with the right training, we can travel anywhere, find anyone and... Bishop stopped pushing the chair, and his eyes hardened with determination. We can manipulate dreams, Marcel. Pervert them in such a way as to end the life of the dreamer. He paused and stroked his beard head down. It is not an easy task. 
It takes days, weeks or even months to find one person among the millions who dream in any city. Then when we recognize them we twist their dreams. We create a level of stress so high that the victim has no choice but to let go. He gives up and his heart stops. How many have you done this to? Too many. And there will be many more. Soon the bosses realize that in the long run, killing a leader, someone in a high political or military position did not help. Another took his place, ready to follow the same orders. But they also knew the old man had greater powers than that. More than controlling dreams. More than ending someone's life from his bed. Iroquois did not want to show me. By then his hands were already stained with blood. I visit this memory often. I beg him to show me the way to destroy that barrier between what we dream and reality. But he refuses. Maybe with you. Why don't you ask him? Wouldn't you like to escape from Lyle de Lara? 12. You did what? Andre let his fork, still covered in green puree, drop to the table. Shush. Phyllis shushed him with a finger, but his broad smile showed his rat teeth. And who left that food there? Did you buy off the guards? Don't even suggest it. We don't know how it got there. Phyllis answered frantically. Marcel dreamed that he stole some food from the kitchen and it appeared there when he woke up. Phyllis stopped talking as a lull fell across the dining room. There was no longer the murmurs of gossip or the clanging of silverware against plates, nor the boisterous laughter and bawdy toasts from the guard's table. The dining room was in absolute silence. We all turned around, looking at the dining room door. Crossing the frame, Blutch entered with his truncheon over his shoulder. His eyes scanned the dining room. He turned his head like a hungry animal sniffing for prey. All eyes in the dining room followed him. He approached our table, and I saw that he was carrying something in his other hand. Shit. I said to myself. How could I have been so stupid? Phyllis went pale. He also recognized the bundle that Blutch was carrying. Blutch dropped it on the table. Whose pillow is this? While he spoke he did not take his eyes off me. Mine, I said, preparing to receive the blow of his truncheon. But instead, he returned it to his holster. With both hands he opened the pillow cover and extracted the two empty bottles. I had hidden them there temporarily, waiting for a better time to get rid of them. How had he found out so quickly? Two beer bottles, some silverware and a plate. I noticed all the other prisoners staring at me. Nobody spoke, they didn't even whisper, they didn't dare. Can you tell me who gave you all this? I found it in front of my cell door. His small pupils dilated and I thought I saw sparks coming out of his ears. I know my boys didn't do this for you. I trained them myself and they know what the punishment is for disobeying me. With deliberation, he removed the pillow from its cover, leaving the incriminating evidence hidden inside. So. The only explanation is that Santa Claus came before Christmas and left you some presents, right? Of all the blocks of all the cells he came to yours. You were just that high on his list. All right, if the fat man in the red suit gave it to you then who am I to argue, you can keep it. I didn't have time to react. He swung the pillow cover filled with the plate, the bottles and the cutlery against my head with such force that I flew off my chair, fell to the floor and hit my temple against the tiles. He didn't stop there. He continued to pummel me. The cutlery against the glass and the tin made a muffled clang every time the cover hit me. I felt a crunch and something wet ran down my forehead. My eyes clouded and I tried to raise my hands to protect myself but Blutch kicked them away and continued to beat me. Again. And again. I ended up face down, exhausted by the rain of blows that split my skin and broke the bones of my face. A trickle of blood spilt from my mouth and formed a puddle on the floor, next to two of my teeth. 
From the floor, I could only see Blutch's blurred feet and the soaked pillow cover stained crimson. He kept hitting me even after I lost consciousness. 13. I'm a mess, I said aloud as I examined myself. I had lost a lot of blood and several teeth. My head was swollen like a balloon, my face was discolored. It was violet, bulging at the cheekbones, forehead and chin. My nose was crumpled in, and my eyes were dilated and sunken in bags of blood. I was unrecognizable. Less than a person, I was an aberration. Mess is generous. But look on the bright side. Bishop stood next to me, looming over my body. My other self, the body that dreamed me, was kneeling chained hand and foot to the wall. You've earned your first trip to the shed. I did it, Bishop. I managed to move things in my dream, things that moved in reality. I needed a lot of time to develop my abilities to that level. Without a doubt, you have natural talent. I am convinced that Iroquois recognized it. I nodded. My other self had his head slumped between his shoulders. They had reluctantly sewn shut the gap in my left temple, thirteen stitches with thick thread, so I wouldn't bleed to death. That Blutch is a twisted sadist. I know. He's been torturing me for three years. I would have killed him if he wasn't protected. A round table of food appeared in front of us, then he snapped his fingers and we teleported onto the roof of the prison. Please eat something. It seems silly, but tricking your brain into thinking that it's eating makes fasting much easier. I listened and sat at the table. There was braised chicken with oily glistening skin, and potatoes cut into thin slices with cloves of garlic and tomatoes. At the first bite I felt better. For every poison there is an antidote, Bishop continued as he poured us wine. There is a way to defeat any power. With that, I don't mean to say that our skills are a poison far from it. He drained the whole glass at once and poured another. In my particular case, to defeat my abilities, there is something called a dream catcher. They are amulets made of wood and rope that people hang on windows or doors to prevent a visitor in their dreams. I thought they were just a trick for tourists. Not all the amulets are authentic. The ones they sell in tourist markets are decorative baubles, but authentic ones take account of certain minerals in their construction and incorporate feathers from birds that have been sacrificed in a special way. I don't want to bore you with the details. When all those generals and politicians began to fall while they were sleeping, they smelled something strange was happening. They soon discovered that dream catchers protected them, and now everyone who believes they are a potential target uses one, including the great majority of the staff of this prison and of course its chief warden and the foreman. Wait, the guard who died a few weeks ago, did you kill him? I have already confessed that I dislike what I do. The pressure I am under to comply with orders is... I am human after all. They left me an opening, after punishing me so relentlessly. I had to make a stand. Fear is an effective weapon. But wasn't Blutch responsible? They have my daughter and my wife Marcel. I have done things that would embarrass the devil. And what have they done for me? Locked me in here. Kidnapped my family. They won't even let me see her, Marcel. I understood his pain. I couldn't see Bernadette either. I had been separated from her. I had killed the commander, but I was not a murderer. Could I be one if the need arose? I had killed a few in our aerial battles, but they were enemies that was war. We're going to get out of here, Marcel. We will leave Lyle de Lara and never come back. Oh yeah. And how do you plan to do that? You will get us out of here. He pointed at me and raised his glass of wine. But for this you have to train and train. It won't be long. You're almost ready. 17. The feeling was strange. 
I felt suspended as if I was floating in the middle of the sea. I was wrapped in a shadow that carried me forward and followed my every intention like a well-tailored suit stitched from smoke. I left the cell, slipping straight through the bars and walked to the end of block A there was a small office and beyond that corridors that connected with the other blocks. I went through the open door of the office in search of the night guard. He was sitting with his feet on the desk, reading a paperback novel. On the table, he had a bottle of beer and a plate of leftovers. A large ring of keys hung from his belt, next to his truncheon and his pistol. He balanced his chair upon two legs. I approached from behind. He turned the page and let out a loud laugh. He couldn't see me. He couldn't feel me there beside him. I was so close I could smell the sweat on the back of his neck. I pulled on the back of the chair, and he collapsed on the floor. While he was flailing like a cockroach trying to get to his feet, I unsheathed his truncheon, lifted it high and let it fall on his head. One sharp low and he stopped struggling instantly. I made sure he was still breathing then I snatched the keys from his belt. I looked at his gun with indecision. I decided not to touch it. Unlike my body, the objects I held, like the keys or the truncheon, could not pass through the doors and walls. To get through the doors, I had to pass them carefully through the spaces between the bars. I went back to my cell, opening the access doors to the block and covering my trail by turning the lock, leaving the door closed. Phyllis slept with his back to the wall. My body sat cross-legged on the floor, sweating visibly with tight lips. The effort of concentration needed to move and hold solid objects was consuming me. I felt that I couldn't take much more, but there was still a lot to do. I pressed on with the plan. I went back along the corridors, ignoring the turning that led to the dining room and the stairs to the infirmary. I opened the locked door that led to Block B, and in a room identical to the one I had been moments before, I found another night guard. He slept deeply. Feeling relieved, I closed the office door and continued on. In Block B, almost everyone was sleeping. There were two guards on the floor above sharing a cigarette. Bishop planned to cross this block during the changing of the guard, when they would be distracted. The title of safest prison in the world had gone to their heads, they were confident that no one could escape from their cells. But of course, who could imagine an escape like this? I kept to the shadows. If they had turned around, they would have seen the keys and the truncheon floating across the block. An old man without a shirt, leaning against the bars of his cell, saw me. He began to scream with a broken voice and his eyes rolling back. He sputtered and ranted senselessly. I stood motionless in the shadow of a pillar, with my heart in my fist. The guards ignored him. When I reached Block C, I discovered that most of the cells were empty. Here the bars were thicker, each had two locks and there were no windows. I went up the metal stairs and looked for cell 373. Bishop was stretched out on a dirty sheet. His body was visibly traumatized by fasting and beatings. Seeing the keys floating in front of his cell, he shouted. Eureka! You've got it, Marcel. I smiled at him, although he did not see me. I opened the cell using the keys marked with the letter C, and the door swung wide. Don't worry about me. Bishop sat up with difficulty, looking too weak to walk. I'll count to a hundred, and then I'll head to the meeting point. I set off without looking back. The plan was very simple. I had to open an escape route to the outside. From what we had seen on our dream visits, the least watched exit was a cargo shutter in the kitchen. That's where the food and frozen boxes came in to be kept in refrigerated rooms. Once that door was unlocked, I had to go back to my body and go all the way there without being seen. About 200 meters from there, across a dirt road, was the small shack that served as a hangar. The SE-5 waited for us there, our ticket off the island. On paper, every step would be simple and silent. 
I opened the kitchen door and the cargo shutter without problems. A sea breeze filled the kitchen. The air was moist and cold and the sky was marred with large clusters of clouds. It wasn't a good night to fly, but there was no good night for this. The problem started when Bishop appeared in the kitchen. His ghostly image with cadaverous almost translucent skin made my hair stand on end. He was supposed to wait for the shift change so that we both crossed the road together. I stood in the doorway observing how, with more impetus than strength, he slipped through the shutter and went out onto the dirt road dragging his feet. The rhythm of guards' rounds gave us 30 minutes margin, a count of 1,800 before the change. At that time my body also needed to be in the hangar, ready to take off. Bishop had disappeared in the darkness of the road. In the background, I could see the light of the lighthouse and the illuminated windows of the foreman's mansion on the promontory. There was no other light besides a half-moon that appeared intermittently, a shy slit among the clouds. Someone has been here. I heard a voice cry behind me. The kitchen door burst open. Quick! Blut shouted. At first I thought he was pointing at me with his truncheon, but he had no idea I was there. The cargo shutter is open. Sound the alarm. Two guards appeared behind him, heading for the red button on the wall behind me. That would alert the entire prison and endanger our escape. I had to do something. No one had turned on the kitchen light yet, the little light in the room came from under the shutter. I prayed that Bishop had already reached the hangar safely. I tripped the first guard. He fell flat on the floor with no idea what had tripped him. The other guard stretched out his hand, and his fingers were almost on the button. I had no choice but to use the truncheon. I swung it with all my strength against his nose, and he staggered back a couple of meters, crashing into Blutch. What the fuck? Blutch gritted his teeth and his tiny eyes lit up like red embers. He unholstered his pistol and held it with a firm hand, his elbow close to his body and his wrist at his waist. Come out or I'll blow you straight to hell. I didn't move, I hugged the shadows where the truncheon and the keys were hidden. Turn on the lights. Bishop ordered the guard that I had tripped as he came back to join them. He walked around Blutch to the switch by the door. Blutch kept the gun pointed in my direction. I didn't know what would happen if a bullet went through my smoky projection, and I didn't want to find out unless I had no other option. The guard I struck with the truncheon lay unconscious with his nose broken, kissing the ground. As the other guard flipped the light switch, I threw the keys away from me against the opposite wall. Everything after that happened in a blur. Light flooded the room, and the noise of the keys alerted them. They turned their backs on me, looking for the source, and I took my opportunity to charge at them with the truncheon. The first blow was aimed at Blutch's head, but I missed. Instead, I hit him between the shoulder blades, and that only served to anger him. He span around, but I was ready with another blow that caught him in the jaw and made his teeth grind. He stumbled into a cart full of dishes and glasses that crashed to the ground. While Blutch was trying to get up, the other guard sprang into action. He watched the club that floated in the air and followed it with his eyes to where my body would be. Then with trembling hands he drew his revolver and fired three shots. The bullets went through me as if passing through air, digging into the concrete wall behind me. I was expecting searing pain but this made sense. Blutch managed to sit up and fired at me again and again until the revolver was empty. I approached slowly and I grabbed his hand, forcing him to raise his arm and the revolver along with it. His eyes went wide, incredulous, not knowing what or who was pulling his wrist. As he watched his own hand, astonished, I hit him in the head with a dull thump. I knew that his skull would be hard, for a moment I thought that the truncheon would break against his forehead. He collapsed like a tree that has been chopped down part way and then topples under its own weight. The remaining guard, seeing Blutch fall, tried to run for the door that led to the corridor. I threw the truncheon after him, 
and he stumbled and fell to the ground. That stopped him long enough that I could dive on him and grab him by the leg. Help! He shouted. Let go! He squeezed the trigger of his weapon, but he had no more bullets to shoot. Blutch's weapon was on the ground. I took it by the barrel and used the butt to knock the guard out. I sighed with relief. Then I realized that surely the whole prison had heard the shots and all the struggle in the kitchen. If I didn't hurry, the guards would be everywhere. 18. When I woke up, the first thing I heard was the alarm. Phyllis jumped down from the bunk. What's going on? He asked, rubbing his eyes. I didn't have time to explain it to him. The biplane couldn't take off with four of us, but maybe it could take three. Follow me. I got up from the bed, aware again of my swollen face disfigured by the beating. The cut on my forehead was throbbing with pain, and the infected skin around it was burning. I felt my body too slow, too heavy. I ran to the door of the cell, shoving it open with my shoulder and sprang into the hall ready to run. Looking back, I saw Phyllis staring at the gaping door. You coming, or would you prefer to stay? What's happening? What are you guys doing? Andre's unmistakable voice sounded from the next cell. Phyllis blinked and started. I'm sorry, Andre. I shouted as I ran. I promise I'll come back for you. I don't know if he heard me. By the time I finished yelling at him, I was already in the hallway across the guard's office, on my way to the kitchen. Phyllis was right behind me. I wasn't going to fail him. If this power I possessed could help him escape, I would find a way. They're coming after us. Phyllis shouted between breaths. Shit. Run. We arrived at the kitchen, and we nearly tripped over the unconscious bodies of the three guards lying on the ground. Putin, said Phyllis, pointing at the cut on Blutch's head. Blood poured from it, forming small puddles between the tiles of the floor. Close the door. I ordered, searching for the keys that I had thrown across the room before. When I found them, the guards were already shoving and kicking at the door. Phyllis could barely hold it. The keys clanged between my trembling fingers. When I found the correct one, I jammed it into the lock and told Phyllis it was safe to let go. On the other side of the door, the guards shouted and blasphemed. The crunch of the dark dirt rode under our feet like stepping into heaven itself, but just after coming through the shutter, two large circles of light swept over the ground towards us, fluttering like insects on the stones and bushes of the road. The turrets. I shouted. We have to avoid the spotlights. Phyllis leaned forward for a moment, resting his hands on his knees. Give me a second. Shots rang out the other side of the kitchen door, and several holes appeared around the handle. There's no time. Run. Give it everything you've got. The lock flew through the air and three or four guards armed with rifles appeared. We were already running into the darkness. The gravel floor cracked beneath our feet and the bullets whistled by far too close for comfort. The guards, aiming from the doorframe, fired blind bursts at us. Get down. Get down. I told Phyllis in a hoarse whisper to find a divot deep enough to offer cover. Phyllis. There was no sign of him. The spotlight swept the shrubbery near me. Does anyone see them? shouted one of the guards on the wall. Nothing. They must be hiding on the floor, answered one by the door. Let's split up and sweep the area. Phyllis. I whispered again. Here, Marcel. The weak voice of my cellmate came from a few meters in front of me. The guards were approaching our location. I tried not to make noise. The bulbs passed close again, brushing the leg of my pants. If I stretched out my hands, I could touch Phyllis's foot. 
They hit me in the leg, Marcel. I reached forward to check his leg and felt something wet. Run, he whispered. Leave me. They're coming. One of the guards had found a flashlight and now he was advancing towards us, sweeping the floor with light. Behind him were the other three guards. I can't move. Get up. We can make it, I'm sure. I held my breath for a few seconds, assessing the situation. If only I had picked up that revolver, maybe now I could scare the guards away. Run. Run. I obeyed. I got up and ran in the direction of the hangar. I felt one of the spotlights on my back, my own shadow was running in front of me, I was in a hurry to catch up with it. The low rumble of the tower machine gun burst into the night, followed by the sound of bullets sinking into the road beside me. I ran and I ran. Over the roar of the gun I heard Phyllis shouting at my back. Here you bastards. I'm over here. When I got to the hangar, the door was open, but there was no one inside. There was only the SE5 sitting in the shadows, raising its slender nose like a proud bird. I climbed up to look in the cockpit. The driver's hat and glasses were in the seat. I got off the plane and stood in front of the propellers, ready to turn them on and start the engine. Well, Bishop, where the hell have you gotten to? When I saw the foreman's mansion under the glare of the lighthouse, I had a revelation. What if Bishop had gone there instead of staying in the hangar? That's why he hadn't waited for me. Damn you, Bishop. I started to head towards the mansion, but the sound of shots from that direction stopped me. There was a sharp cry and then a voice tore through the night, new. Bishop. Behind me, two guards had taken Phyllis into custody, and another group was advancing towards the hangar. There. There he is. Near the hangar. One of the guards shouted, as a clearing opened in the clouds and let in the light of the half-moon. I cursed my luck and Bishop and I ran to the biplane. I spanned the propeller with all my strength, jumped into the cockpit and yanked the ignition lever. The engine roared at being treated so rough, but the plane began to roll forward, leaving the hangar and out onto the short runway. It was the shortest runway I'd ever seen, and it ended on a cliff edge. The headwind was strong and sprayed salt water in my face. When the plane crossed the dirt road, the guards unloaded their rifles at me. Also the tower, now with its spotlights tracing my path, launched a fierce burst of bullets. Some of those bullets hit the back of the plane, tearing the canopy, but without causing any serious damage to the structure. The takeoff speed was correct. I checked the compass and altimeter as I sped forward. They were working correctly. I pulled up on the steering lever, preparing for takeoff. At that moment a figure came charging into the middle of the runway, and for a second I thought it was Bishop, but as I approached full speed, I saw that he was wearing a guard uniform. I didn't change course, hoping to scare him out of my path. Just before one of the wings struck him, he threw himself to the ground and rolled. The end of the track was close. When I tried to raise the nose into the sky, I could feel that the biplane was pulling to the left. One hand appeared at the edge of the cockpit, then another. I stood up in my seat and what I saw terrified me. The face completely covered in blood and wild eyes looking at me with unchained anger. Glutch. He showed his blood-stained teeth as he tried to haul his body into the cockpit. When he was halfway in, he raised his chest and threw a punch that made me release the steering lever. With the taste of salt and blood in my mouth I threw myself against him and we locked hands. He supported one of his feet on a wing, which caused the aeroplane to jerk off the side of the runway. We tipped and bounced over rocks and bushes. The jolting almost shook him loose. I shoved him and he slipped again, but this time he grabbed onto one of the wooden struts along the wing. I regained control of the steering lever. I was going to take off regardless of Blutch. Quickly, without giving me a chance to react, 
the runway ended and we shot over the cliff edge. I pulled with all my strength on the lever using both hands, trying to raise the nose while stabilizing the biplane, counteracting the weight of Blutch. With a whimper from the engine, the plane rose above the crashing waves. The plane began to climb into the sky meter by meter, gradually rising above the lighthouse, the prison and the island. Once we had reached enough height, I released the lever and peeked out from the cockpit. Blutch was clinging to the support by the tips of his fingers. The rest of his body hung over the edge of the wing. The sea now far below us was rough and probably very, very cold. Blutch, I said, the memory of the beating that had disfigured me still sharp in my mind, go to hell. I turned the biplane 90 degrees, forcing Blutch to hold all his weight with one hand. No. He cried seconds before falling into space. I didn't look back. I gained altitude until I was soaring through the clouds. The half-moon shone and its pale light bathed the chassis of the SE-5. For the moment I was safe and on my way. Bernadette, here I come, I thought, and dropped the plane down again. I would fly low, hiding in the shadows and silence as if I were a dream that slips in through the crack of a window. Epilogue Monday, November 11th, 1918, Paris. Today Paris is overflowing with people. It's official. The armistice has been signed and everyone has poured into the streets waving banners and handkerchiefs. I've been dodging through crowds all day and all that yelling and sobbing. It's more than I can bear. The war is over. The war is over. I haven't slept for 11 days. 11. My mind is slowly cracking. I can feel it. It is as if a gash in my head is opening wider and wider, and my sanity is gushing out from it. My body barely obeys me, and the cold of living on the street makes it worse. I discovered that I had lost Bernadette two days ago. After everything I've been through, after crossing forests and mountains, moving only by night, Surviving on any filthy root or dead animal that I could find, making broad detours through villages that were nothing more than piles of stones to avoid the cities. I surprised her as she stepped out from her penthouse on St. Denis Street. She was beautiful and as delicate as a winter flower. As I approached, I felt her expression of rejection like a dagger in my gut. I called after her and I followed her, chasing her down the street, and some men, some meddlesome ignorant men, tried to stop me, thinking I was a stranger to her, nothing more than a madman wanting to bother a young lady. And when she saw my face, she didn't recognize me. As she paled at the deformed jumble of violet bumps that was my face, I recoiled from the repulsion I caused. Although I tried to prove my identity, she didn't believe me. I confessed things that someone else could never know, Nobody but me, her Marcel, but my efforts were useless. She fled crying, scared of this wretch that claimed to be her beloved, the one she had dreamed of for so many nights. The world of dreams calls to me, stronger every day, and I feel the shadow of its presence close at hand. Almost on top of me. I find myself looking back more times than I want to admit, while I stagger through the city, surrounded by strangers, rummaging through the garbage, searching for enough food to survive another day. A couple crossing the street approach me and toss some coins at my bare feet. They think I'm a vagabond. This forced vigil is ruining both my body and my mind. Yesterday, I thought I saw the commander of my squadron. He was strolling with the other passers-by. He smiled at me with a bullet hole in his windpipe. Has lack of sleep driven me mad? I should not fall asleep. I should not fall asleep. I tell myself again and again. My eyelids want to close. They are as heavy as if they were slabs of stone. I force them to stay open because my life hangs by this fine thread of alertness. Paris in winter is, it was so beautiful when I was in love and the war was still so far away. I grab a handful of snow and bury my face into it. People whisper and turn away from me, they can't even look at me. I get up, 
fearful of attracting too much attention. I know that the police are still looking for me. Newspapers are full of sensationalist headlines. War hero escapes the most secure prison in Europe. Wanted, decorated pilot court-martialed for murder. Shooting on Lyle de Lara ends with three dead and the murderer on the run. I drag myself along the wall. My legs seem soft when I step on the pavement, and I have to lean on the windows and lampposts to keep from falling. Suddenly, across the street, I see Iroquois among the crowd at the pedestrian crossing. This time he doesn't have his wheelchair. He walks with his bare feet like mine. He raises a weathered hand and greets me. His feathers and braids flutter. He carries on his way and I try to follow but I lose sight of him. People jostle me and yell at me or they run from me, scared. They don't consider me one of them because of my appearance. I am so ruined. I see the vibrant colors of the old man's blanket. A few meters ahead he walks into an alley. I follow after among a group of old women dressed in black with white handkerchiefs in their hands, and I enter the alley. Iroquois. Iroquois. Stop. I need your help. When I step on a small frozen puddle, I slip and smash my face into the asphalt. The alley is a dead end, and there at the end of it in the shadows, someone is staring at me. It's not Iroquois. My friend, he says in a low calm voice and moves toward me. Sorry. I'm so sorry. You will have to forgive me. I have to do it. Why, Bishop? I try to back away, dragging my body with my hands. Why? We can work together. We can fight against them. I can't risk it, Marcel. Bishop sinks his face into his hands. They killed my wife, Marcel. My wife right in front of me. My daughter now is all I have. I have to eliminate you. You are too dangerous to them, otherwise they'll hurt her. I can't retreat any further. My back hits the wall of the alley. I lift my index and ring finger and try to pierce the palm of my hand. How is this possible? I exclaim when I see that my fingers easily meet through my skin and bones. Nobody can live without sleep, without dreaming, Marcel. No one. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Bishop turns his back on me and heads for the brick wall. He turns a moment, his face is twisted by grief and regret. We were so close. Then he melts with through wall and I find myself alone in the alley. Their absolute silence. I can't hear the footsteps of the crowds nor their cries nor their cheers. The war is over, they were saying. Someone steps into the alley. My heart starts beating fast even before I turn around. Blutch stands over me, his tattered uniform hanging from his waist, his leather truncheon in his hand and his face a mask of blood. Behind him is the commander, with the bullet hole in his neck and armed with the gun that ended his life. My squadmates are there too, their clothes and their faces are faded, a mere shadow of what they were. Their chests are filled with dozens of bullet holes. They all crowd around me, and I am so terrified that I can't even think about moving. Blutch raises his club and smiles. And his smile gives me the chills. That smile is so. Epilogue Monday, November 11th, 1918, Paris Today Paris is overflowing with people. It's official. The armistice has been signed and everyone has poured into the streets waving banners and handkerchiefs. I've been dodging through crowds all day and all that yelling and sobbing. It's more than I can bear. The war is over. The war is over. I haven't slept for eleven days. Eleven. My mind is slowly cracking. I can feel it. It is as if a gash in my head is opening wider and wider, and my sanity is gushing out from it. My body barely obeys me, and the cold of living on the street makes it worse. I discovered that I had lost Bernadette two days ago. After everything I've been through, after crossing forests and mountains, 
moving only by night, surviving on any filthy root or dead animal that I could find, making broad detours through villages that were nothing more than piles of stones to avoid the cities. I surprised her as she stepped out from her penthouse on St. Denis Street. She was beautiful and as delicate as a winter flower. As I approached, I felt her expression of rejection like a dagger in my gut. I called after her and I followed her, chasing her down the street, and some men, some meddlesome ignorant men, tried to stop me, thinking I was a stranger to her, nothing more than a madman wanting to bother a young lady. And when she saw my face, she didn't recognize me. As she paled at the deformed jumble of violet bumps that was my face, I recoiled from the repulsion I caused. Although I tried to prove my identity, she didn't believe me. I confessed things that someone else could never know, nobody but me, her Marcel, but my efforts were useless. She fled crying, scared of this wretch that claimed to be her beloved, the one she had dreamed of for so many nights. The world of dreams calls to me stronger every day, and I feel the shadow of its presence close at hand, almost on top of me. I find myself looking back more times than I want to admit, while I stagger through the city, surrounded by strangers, rummaging through the garbage, searching for enough food to survive another day. A couple crossing the street approach me and toss some coins at my bare feet. They think I'm a vagabond. This forced vigil is ruining both my body and my mind. Yesterday I thought I saw the commander of my squadron, he was strolling with the other passers-by. He smiled at me, with a bullet hole in his windpipe. Has lack of sleep driven me mad? I should not fall asleep. I should not fall asleep. I tell myself again and again. My eyelids want to close. They are as heavy as if they were slabs of stone. I force them to stay open because my life hangs by this fine thread of alertness. Paris in winter is... It was so beautiful when I was in love and the war was still so far away. I grab a handful of snow and bury my face into it. People whisper and turn away from me, they can't even look at me. I get up, fearful of attracting too much attention. I know that the police are still looking for me. Newspapers are full of sensationalist headlines, war hero escapes the most secure prison in Europe, Wanted, decorated pilot court-martialed for murder. Shooting on Lyle de Lara ends with three dead and the murderer on the run. I drag myself along the wall. My legs seem soft when I step on the pavement, and I have to lean on the windows and lampposts to keep from falling. Suddenly, across the street, I see Iroquois among the crowd at the pedestrian crossing. This time he doesn't have his wheelchair. He walks with his bare feet like mine. He raises a weathered hand and greets me. His feathers and braids flutter. He carries on his way and I try to follow but I lose sight of him. People jostle me and yell at me or they run from me, scared. They don't consider me one of them because of my appearance. I am so ruined. I see the vibrant colors of the old man's blanket. A few meters ahead he walks into an alley. I follow after among a group of old women dressed in black with white handkerchiefs in their hands, and I enter the alley. Iroquois. Iroquois. Stop. I need your help. When I step on a small frozen puddle, I slip and smash my face into the asphalt. The alley is a dead end, and there at the end of it, in the shadows, someone is staring at me. It's not Iroquois. My friend, he says in a low calm voice and moves toward me. Sorry. I'm so sorry. You will have to forgive me. I have to do it. Why, Bishop? I try to back away, dragging my body with my hands. Why? We can work together. We can fight against them. I can't risk it, Marcel. Bishop sinks his face into his hands. They killed my wife Marcel. My wife right in front of me. My daughter now is all I have. I have to eliminate you, you are too dangerous to them, otherwise they'll hurt her. I can't retreat any further. My back hits the wall of the alley. 
I lift my index and ring finger and try to pierce the palm of my hand. How is this possible? I exclaim when I see that my fingers easily meet through my skin and bones. Nobody can live without sleep, without dreaming, Marcel. No one. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Bishop turns his back on me and heads for the brick wall. He turns a moment, his face is twisted by grief and regret. We were so close. Then he melts with through wall and I find myself alone in the alley. Their absolute silence. I can't hear the footsteps of the crowds nor their cries nor their cheers. The war is over, they were saying. Someone steps into the alley. My heart starts beating fast even before I turn around. Blutch stands over me, his tattered uniform hanging from his waist, his leather truncheon in his hand and his face a mask of blood. Behind him is the commander, with the bullet hole in his neck and armed with the gun that ended his life. My squadmates are there too, their clothes and their faces are faded, a mere shadow of what they were. Their chests are filled with dozens of bullet holes. They all crowd around me, and I am so terrified that I can't even think about moving. Blutch raises his club and smiles. And his smile gives me the chills. That smile is so.